you're listening to the Attempt Adventure Podcast, a podcast about finding adventure every day and making life more interesting. From Bangkok, Thailand, I am Michael DeRosiers, joined as always by my co-host, James Barrett from Dallas, Texas. James, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself, buddy? Same old, same old. It's getting really hot here. We're creeping up on Songkran, so... Um, <laughs> it's uh, for the second year in a row, they've banned uh, water activities. Mm-hmm. Songkran, for those of you who don't know, is the traditional Thai New Year. And over the years, it's become a giant citywide water gun fight. It can be a lot of fun, a little chaotic. Last year, it was canceled completely. This year, they've canceled the water gun part of it. Anyway, so it's coming up, but it's it's in the hottest part of the year, and so it's getting really, really hot. Just imagine the first the first year they can do the water guns again. It's going to be crazy. Like people are going to go wild. People are absolutely going to go wild. If I'm not directly participating, I stay inside um, for three days. Because the thing is, you're fair game. If you're outside, you're fair game. You're walking down the street, and some pickup truck will drive past, and some teenagers in the back will just dump a bucket of water on you. And you have to be okay with that. I mean, <laughs> sounds honestly, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> well, it, it's fun once, like or or they'll, there's another thing that they'll do. They'll get some uh, some powder, some white powder, and they'll just run up and they'll smear it on your face. You're like you're walking to work, and some person will just run up to you and smear paste on your face, <laughs> and then dump a bucket of water on your head. And you're like, oh great, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but it is fun. It is fun. I feel like you get to work, and they're like. Huh. <laughs> It's something you have to experience, and you have to be in the right mindset for it. And I'm not always in the right mindset when it gets here. I feel like they might target expats on purpose just for the fun of it. There are certain neighborhoods where that would probably happen, yes. Especially if you're like in a business suit or something. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be intentionally wanting to participate, and then it's so much fun. But if you're just trying to go to the 7-Eleven, it's a little bit annoying. But you mm. got to fix your mindset. you got to enjoy it because it is, it is a fun a fun holiday. But it's coming up soon. And it's hot outside, so you know. Correct. Miserably hot, one might say. <laughs> you'd probably be annoyed, but then you'd be like, oh, that's kind of nice. Yeah. All right. Well, as a reminder to all of our listeners, don't forget to participate in our monthly challenge. For April, your monthly challenge is to make a cup of coffee outside. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to. I've got some ideas. I was just about to say that. I was like, I have not done it yet. Well, James, that's because you and I are recording this in March, and if we did it now, we'd be cheating. So That's true. <laughs> it's the April challenge, so don't <laughs> worry. Our laziness can, can serve a purpose. Um, <laughs> if you do make a cup of coffee outside, don't forget to snap a photograph. Hashtag attempt adventure at the end of the month. If we like your picture, you might just win a very nifty prize. Yeah. And if you don't like coffee, it can be tea. It can be yeah, pretty much anything. Just make a drink outside. But don't just drink a drink. You have to make it. That's the thing. You have to prepare it in some way. You can't just go outside and open a Coca-Cola. It doesn't count. Yeah, it doesn't count. You have to do something. All right, James. Well, did you do anything new and interesting this week? Yes, I did. I was in Colorado. We were up in Boulder, Colorado, which I had been... Th- through but never really in drove up in the mountains on the one good day we had there Mm. tried some local beer some local food just a good time but then it snowed and we kind of got stuck so my all my ideas for drone footage and everything else just sort of went out the window you can't predict these things can you no actually what we're going to talk about today your misadventures were inspiration for today's episode of the podcast So that was sort of, it. it's not so new, but it's in a new place, and I did new things while I was there, which is really the point. Mm-hmm. That's cool. You went somewhere you'd never been before, and that's mm-hmm. awesome. How about you? So, uh, James, you know that I've been recently training at the Thai National Museum to be a volunteer tour guide. It's a pretty cool program. It's the only place in the entire country where foreigners are permitted to be guides. It's a program that's been going on for over 40 years now. They like offering tours in people's native languages because a lot of the art and a lot of the artifacts at the National Museum are very contextual. And it's one thing for a guide to say what something is and where it's from, but 
it's difficult sometimes for a Thai guide, even if they're very, very good at English, to explain something like a piece of religious art in a context that makes sense to a tourist. Mm. And so they train, they train foreign guides to have a really in-depth knowledge of art history and culture and religion and art so that we're able to offer these tours and explain things in a way that visitors can understand. And these are it's a free program. If you come to the National Museum, you can get a, a free tour. Uh, they currently offer tours in English, German, French, and Japanese. So I've signed up, and I'm doing the English training program. It's a six-month training program. Hmm. A guide. It's pretty in- intensive. Every Monday, we meet at the Foreign Correspondence Club, and we have a lecture. And this could be by any kind of expert. It could be by a current guide. We've had professors come in. A uh, lecture about some different, either a different time period or a different aspect of Thai art history. For example, the first lecture was about Hinduism in Thailand. The second one was about Buddhism. We've been doing prehistory. And then on Thursdays, we go to the museum itself and tour the galleries and get to know the artifacts and the exhibits that we're going to be presenting. So it's a really cool program. It's something new that I've been doing. It was delayed because of COVID. I was hoping to do this program last year. But it's finally a go. So I've, I've joined that, and it's kind of exciting. That's, that's really cool. My, my new thing that I'm doing. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm excited to hear more as the training goes on. And when I visit next, I'm excited for a tour. Definitely, you will get a free, personalized <laughs> guiding <laughs> tour at the Bangkok nice. National Museum next time you're in town. And it's, it's really cool that they thought about that to give tours in people's native languages because... It is hard to, it's one thing to say, this is this old. Yeah. But it's another thing entirely to explain the context behind it. And and sometimes as a person in the culture, you have a difficult, I mean, I even fall into this in Thai culture. In my, in my interview I did with Chris Christensen and the Amateur Traveler podcast, at one point I was talking about some temple, I think in, in Kanchanaburi, and I was just talking and I said, oh yeah, and people go there and they, and they make merit and I do this and, and he stopped me and he's like, hey, can you explain for our listeners what making merit is? And for me, it's just something that's so common. I just didn't even think that the listeners didn't know about it. But of course, it's only a thing here in Thailand and it's an act of good karma. Mm-hmm. It's a good act in accumulation of good karma. You know, for me, that was, it was so contextual because I, I knew what that was and I just didn't even think to explain it. And so, but if you're growing up in the culture, it's even more so. I mean, you know these things because they're so ingrained in the culture. I mean, that would be like... I don't. Even, I can't even think of a good analog, but it'd be like somebody in America mentioning something about George Washington and just expecting all of the audience mm-hmm. to know who George Washington is, which most Americans would. But maybe there's some foreign tourist that wouldn't know who he was or why he was important. You know, so so I think it's a, it's a great idea. I think it's a really cool idea, and it's not a very it's not a very well known program, but it's a fantastic museum. It's housed at the old Front Palace, which used to be the palace of the Viceroy of Thailand back when there was a viceroy. And I know you've done some work at museums, so maybe we could have a museum episode when I'm all done with this. (laughs) That'd be cool. So James, I know you, you said your trip this weekend while fun, maybe didn't exactly go according to plan. Right. That happens sometimes. It happens frequently. It does. That's part of traveling. I think is sometimes your adventures don't go according to plan. So for this episode, we thought we would each think of a couple different times that we had been on a trip and things didn't go the way we wanted them to go. Um, Would you like to go first, James? Do you have a story you'd like to tell? Sure. I'm just going to jump into it. It was a trip you and I took when we went to Florida. Okay. For the most part, that trip was pretty much as we planned, besides the fact that we ran out of money a lot quicker than I think we expected to. It was quite a good trip, though. I have fond memories of, of that trip. It was a really good trip. We ran out of money. We lived off Pringles and beer. Well, the problem was that the only food within walking distance was CVS, and we didn't have a car, and CVS is expensive. It's not like we had a, a Target or a Walmart to go to for mm-hmm. our groceries. We had to be eating out of a drugstore, which is not cheap. Our budget was depleted much more rapidly than we would have anticipated <laughs> that it would have been. Uh, but we didn't have a car, so that's all we could do. Yeah, we didn't have a car. When we went to go snorkeling, we went in the morning first, and for whatever reason, they were like, no, come back later. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Like, not enough people signed up. 
Yeah, yeah, we had paid for the trip, and we had bought beer already, so we carried our beer with us down there, because you're supposed to bring your own beverage. Of course, by the time we actually got out there, I think the beer was a bit warm, because we we had waited for a while. Yeah, but it was like the no come back later actually kind of really threw a wrench in our plan, because we had nothing else to do. (laughs) And so I think we just started drinking, probably. Mm-hmm. And so this this wasn't so much the um, the trip itself, because that went pretty well. It was coming back. So you remember, on our way back, we're sitting in the airport, and just outside the window, we just see these storm clouds rolling in. It's one thing to have a layover at an airport. It's another thing to be told you can't go. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and this isn't like any crazy like, oh no, the all our plans failed, but it definitely is part of a, a trip. It was the unpredictability that really threw us. I mean, we got on and off the plane a couple of times, mm-hmm. you know. We're like, what are we doing? Yeah, and it was hard to get information, and it was a big, big storm. They couldn't take off. They did give us a free cocktail on the flight. I got a gin and tonic, which is a uh-huh. gross cocktail. Yeah, I'm not a fan of gin, famously. I don't know why I ordered it. No, I think I got a whiskey. (laughs) Yeah, you get like something like that, but I got a gin and tonic and I'm sitting there like, you take a sip and you're just going to like, ugh. And so we got to Houston and there's a jack in the box. We're like, all right, let's go get food. And they closed early. You missed the best part, our flight attendant. Oh, yes. We were on Southwest and we got one of those um, very great comedy flight attendants that you sometimes see in YouTube videos. It was great. I'd never had a funny flight attendant before. He was so he was great. He he really cheered us up as we were waiting. Um, but as we were coming down into Houston, <laughs> I just remember he got on and he made an announcement. He goes, "Okay, everyone, sorry about the delay. Um, raise your hand if you have a connection in Houston." And almost everyone raised their hands. And he said, "No, you don't." <laughs> and that was how we we were informed that our onward flight had been canceled, <laughs> which is fine it was really funny yeah it was he he put everyone in a good mood nobody was really mad that was the first time that it ever happened to me i had mm-hmm. never like i had never missed a flight in no. my life ever and so i think that experience actually helped me be able to just like roll with things more mm-hmm. well yeah we didn't really have a, a plan after that we just had to kind of like you said, we got to the airport. We were shuffled into an airport shuttle with that big, huge man. Oh, Lord. We got to the hotel, and the only thing that was open was Jack in the Box, except they didn't let us in for some reason. <laughs> it, was like, it wasn't even like it was like a few minutes before closing. It was like two hours before closing. Yeah, it was like 8, it was like 8 p.m. There was no reason for them to be closed. And they had point. all the doors locked and everything. Yeah, and it was weird. We ordered pizza. By the time we ordered pizza, it was like 30 minutes before closing, and I tipped the guy like $20. That That's my mildest of adventures gone wrong, because it's not even like really going wrong. It's just sort of the the importance of being able to roll with things. That's really funny, James. I'm realizing that a lot of these are things that we've done together. Yep. I didn't even think of the Florida trip. That, that didn't... Um... That didn't Probably register with me. The trip went good. That's one of my favorite trips. But that was a really good trip. <laughs> it was. It was. I, I didn't even think of it as being a failed adventure. Um, but you're right. We did have a bit of a disaster. Although that was certainly not our fault. That was just the, the weather. But that happens. And you think I would look back on that and be frustrated. But it was actually kind of a good time. It was kind of funny. I mean, it's not like... It's, the thing is, it's not like we were alone. I think if I was by myself dealing with that, mm-hmm. I'd be really grumpy. But like, like we were just hanging out together anyway. So it... I was like, you oh, know okay, it's bad whatever. when the captain tells you you can leave the plane. Oh, I know. He was like, if anyone wants to go sit in the sit in the terminal, you can. You're like, it's going to be a minute. But I look back fondly on it. I'm like, it actually extended our vacation a day. It did. So I'm kind of happy about it. It was a lesson to just sort of chill. Because there's nothing you can do about it. It would have been really easy to get mad and like... Especially when we got to Houston and we're literally four hours from home. We could have rented a car and drove home. I think it was probably about the same price to rent a car for the day as it would have been just to check into that hotel for a night. It was. And that's why we did it, I think. What about you? What's your first one? 
Well, since you went with your mildest example, I'm going to go with my mildest example, James, and you were actually on this trip with me as well. It's the time that we accidentally went to Pak Chong. We did. So we had planned a trip to Hua Hin, which is a Thai coastal resort town just on the Thai Gulf. It's a couple hours south of, uh, southwest of Bangkok. Our plan was to go down there by train. Well, the reason that we wanted to take the train is because, number one, the trains in Thailand are generally really good. And number two, this is one of the first train lines in the country, and the train station down there is really historic. It was uh, built under the reign of King Rama V, who is the guy that really modernized Thailand and organized the country with a really good modern rail system. We just we, we wanted to go down there, and I had been on this, this trip before, and the train station down there is very, very cool. It's kind of a very small but Victorian-style train station, and it was just part of the experience. I mean, Hua Hin, I think, is best reached by rail just for the experience. And I'm a big fan of rail travel. So I had bought us tickets on the train. They were evening tickets. I want to say our, our train was probably for like 8 p.m., 7 or 8 p.m. Maybe. Something like that. We get on the train, second class tickets. And right when it's time to go, the train kind of lurches and it moves forward a little bit. And then it stops. And then we sit there <laughs> for a couple hours. And no one tells us anything. No one tells us a thing. We don't know how long we're waiting. We don't know why we're waiting. And the hours creep by. You, I don't know what you had been doing all day, but I had been at work, and I was really tired. It was a Friday night, and I was exhausted. It had been a very long week at work. I had spent the day exploring. It, uh -huh. I, so I wasn't working, but I had been all over the old town. I had been to the malls. I had been just, I had been walking around all day, and so I was also exhausted. And, and mind you, it's like midnight at this point. Yeah, we sat there for like four Four and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And we're finally just like, I think finally I said, James, I'm just, I just can't do this anymore. I'm exhausted. I think I was feeling like I was getting a little bit sick. You know what? Let's just, let's just go home. We can figure this out tomorrow. We can get a bus tomorrow or something like that. And, and finally, I think they were trying to move us to a different train. Mm -hmm. They had everyone get off the train and, and I was like, let's just go home. So we just actually just left. We just walked out of the station and left. Um, I just didn't want to deal with it. And the train journey, it's not fast. I mean, it'll take another three or four hours. Yeah, we wouldn't have got there until like three or four in the morning and no, it was just so it just wasn't worth it so we went back to my apartment and we got out my lonely planet guide and we're like okay we have a weekend what are we going to do i had never been to Khao yai national park it's one of the most famous national parks in thailand i think it's the first national park in thailand it's famous for its beautiful lush hills uh, cooler weather it's got all sorts of wildlife they have wild elephants and gibbons and, and deer all sorts of cool stuff so I'm like, okay, what if we go to Khao Yai National Park? And I've still actually never been there because this is where our story, <laughs> uh, again, derails. So we decide, okay, yeah, that'll be fun. We'll go to the National Park. We'll stay there for like two nights. It'll be great. So the next day, we go to the bus station and we buy two tickets to Pak Chong, which is this little town that is just outside of one of the entrances to the National Park. And the next morning, we get up and we go down to the lobby and we couldn't communicate with the owner. <laughs> oh, and you you also got to remember that when we got there, the bus like wasn't stopping. Oh, right. We had to literally jump out of the moving bus, didn't we, to get to our hotel. We saw our hotel. We had to jump out of the moving. He like slowed down. We saw our hotel and he, I, now I figure he was going to that bus station, but that was like two more miles down the road. Yeah, so we just hopped out. We just hopped out. <laughs> we saw someone else do it, and we were like, all right. So that was already kind of weird. <laughs> and this is a very small town, a very, very small town. Really rural. Well, not rural, but small town. It's a town small town, town, yeah. So we get to the hotel, and mind you, I don't speak Thai very well at this point. This was my like third year in Thailand. I don't speak Thai that well. I can say some things, but I'm not fluent or anything. And we were talking in the lobby, and we were like... Um, okay, we want to go to the National Park. Is there, like, a way to get there? Is there, like, a shuttle bus? Uh, you know, she's like, no. Like, okay, uh, well, could we hire a driver? Because in every hotel I've ever been to in Thailand, they have a tour desk. And if you just say, hey, can I hire a driver for the day? They just hook you up, and it's easy. Uh, this one, they didn't. She said, no. We're like, okay, could we uh, get a taxi to the National Park? She said, no. We're like, okay, can we take a motorbike to the National Park? And she said, No. Yeah. And at this point, it just became ridiculous. And we went outside, we looked around, we couldn't find a taxi. 
on the road anywhere. We couldn't find a driver on the road anywhere. We couldn't even find a tuk-tuk or a song tao, and we're like, what is going on? Uh, this is very strange. We couldn't even find we could find nothing. No way to get you to couldn't park. you couldn't rent a car. You couldn't rent a motorbike. Mm-mm. I have never been anywhere in Thailand where you couldn't rent a scooter. It was really strange. We were so close to the national park entrance, and we couldn't get there. And after like you know half a morning of trying, we finally just gave up, and we ended up just sitting at the hotel, <laughs> <laughs> um, playing phone games and chatting. And it was still fun because we were just chatting and. You had been here for a while. I think you had already been here for like a good week. Yeah. You were probably getting tired too. It was just not, it got to the point where we went and got a drink at 7-Eleven and we went back Mm -hmm. to the hotel and we were just sitting there and you're like, do we keep trying? And we just sort of agreed that we're just going to chill. Yeah. And there was like a a little garden or a park across Mm -hmm. the road. We went to the park, hung out there for a little while. I mean, there were beautiful flowers. It was nice. It just oh, yeah. was like, it was it was a town with very little to do. The weather was actually pretty, it was cooler. It was it was cooler, yeah. It was beautiful. Also, there was not much food to be had, so we just had to eat at 7-Eleven every day. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of it. And then after two nights, we came back to Bangkok. Mission failed. And yeah. again, that, that, that was our call. We decided that we were just going to give up eventually. I mean, sure, maybe we should have taken a bus to Hua Hin. Maybe we should have gone somewhere else. Maybe we should have done our research first. We probably should have. <laughs> um, looking back on it, I think that going to Koh Rat or Nakhon Ratchasima is the better place to go if you're going to the National Park. Uh, but that's not what my guidebook said. So, I mean, it, it also should have been a sign, I think, because I think we were the only tourists there. Mm-hmm. We were the only foreigners in the entirety of Pak Chong. Do you remember how tiny the elevator was at that hotel? Yes, I have a picture. Oh my you god. And, you and I could barely fit next to each other. I mean, we're, we're fairly large guys, but we're not like ridiculously large. Mm-hmm. And there was no room for us and our luggage. Or I think you have a picture of it, and it's amazing. We do somewhere. I, I, I'll, I'll post it if I can find it. That was our call. That was a failure in planning, leading us to just kind of give up. And that's fine sometimes. Sometimes you have to make that call. Because we went to Kanchanahari earlier that trip. Which was a very good trip. Which was a very good trip. We were already satisfied because we'd already had a big adventure. And we were we were exhausted and just yeah. everything else that goes along with it. And then by the time we got to Pak Chong and things just failed completely. Mm-hmm. Everything went wrong. That we just were like, okay, that's enough. Yeah, and I, I, <laughs> and, I think I told this story in another episode, but... The next morning when we went down to the restaurant for breakfast, and we had breakfast tickets. I mean, it was on our little thing they gave us. We were saying that we were down there ready to eat, and they just stared at us blankly. <laughs> I was trying my best in my, my broken tie to say that, yeah, we're, we're here for breakfast. And the, they just kind of laughed awkwardly. It's like, no, it's very clear what we're here for. It's, it's 8 a.m. Other people are eating. Can we come in? We could see where people were sitting there eating. Yeah, and we're, and we're like, like trying to give them the ticket. Like it was, just, it was very strange. And so we finally just gave up on that too. And we were, I think, at that point, we were just so tired. We just went to Cafe Amazon, got a coffee, <laughs> went back home. But <laughs> so that that was a case of things going kind of wrong. But again, it wasn't it wasn't a huge deal. We still had a good trip, and I actually have fond memories of that trip. I actually really liked Pak Chong. It was really relaxing, and, it, and was. it was it was a beautiful little town. We walked up and down the street. It wasn't big at all. It was easy. It was very. It was a different experience, I think. Because mm-hmm. yeah. it was like this is what people do, like that don't live in Bangkok. All right. How about you, James? What have you got? My second one. I'm going to go with my my most recent trip. So we were up there for several reasons. We were looking at scouting areas to live. We're doing all sorts of things, but we had planned on going hiking and doing some stuff like that. It, spring has come and it started to thaw out, and it was supposed to be really nice. The day after we got there, it was like 70 degrees, and it was just beautiful. Mm-hmm. But that day, we had the whole day planned of stuff to do. We had we had stuff we had to do. So the day after that, we woke up, and it had snowed all night. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> it probably would have been fine, but it's just a risk that you really shouldn't take. But instead of getting up there and going in the mountains, we were able to explore a lot more of the town. We ate at this little diner, which was awesome. Good. Local coffee. It's just a good time. At first, you realize that the whole thing you planned isn't going to work. You get a little frustrated. Yeah. You get very frustrated if you let yourself. 
because it's really easy to see the whole day is just ruined. But it's really important to sit back and just sort of say, okay, well, we can't do that. So let's, let's go get a coffee and think about it. I always plan at least one museum day. That way, if it rains or something like that, I have an itinerary of, of a couple museums I want to see anyway, or something indoors, mm-hmm. just an alternative that I probably won't do if it's, if it's nice weather. But it is annoying. It is really annoying because, I mean, that was kind of the reason that you're up there, really. I mean, that's what you wanted to do and what you wanted to see and mm-hmm. something that's taken away from you by something that you can't control. And it's, you know, you kind of feel a little bit powerless about it. But, I mean, it's the weather. <laughs> it's the weather. What are you going to do? Well, you can't do anything. But it ended up being a really good day. And usually they will if you let them. It's about attitude, isn't it? Yes, it really, really is. If you have a bad attitude, which I have have been guilty of, I think we all have, you're not going to enjoy it. You can ruin a whole trip. You just ruin it for yourself, really, with a bad attitude. And, And we've all done it at some point. But if you just think about it and say, well, at least I'm not at home, and then you just keep going. Even sitting in a hotel in a neat place is better than sitting at home doing nothing. (laughs) Right. It just is. It feels better, doesn't it? It just feels nicer. For some reason. Like, sitting all day in a hotel doing nothing is, like, acceptable for some reason. And so that, that, that's the second one I have. Mine are pretty tame. I think you have some more interesting ones. Well, we'll see. My second, my, my next one, the very first time I ever went to Malaysia. (laughs) <laughs> my first trip to Kuala Lumpur, I think you <laughs> you know the story. We had just landed, and I was there with my fiancé and my girlfriend at the time. We were there, and we were going to meet a colleague of mine, also named James, and his wife. I had just come back from America, from visiting America. The school year hadn't started yet. It was just like the week before the new school year started, and I still had a, a couple days left on my re-entry visa before I had to apply for a new one. And my other friend, other James was like, hey, do you want to go to Malaysia? I'm, I'm going down to Kuala Lumpur for a couple of days. And I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I've never been. And so we were actually going to fly down, I think, the day before he was. And so my uh, fiancé and I landed kind of early in the morning, I think. Um, we had just landed, and we were walking around, and suddenly a motorbike just zoomed past and took her bag. Uh, and that's a, a real danger in certain parts of the world. And unfortunately, had the passport in it. Mm -hmm. I don't think we had been to the hotel yet. You know, we were on the way. Uh, Because normally I would say don't carry your passport because they say you have to carry it with you in a lot of places. But I would just recommend carrying a photocopy. Leave it in your hotel precisely because of this. So we were really out of sorts. You know, what do you do in this situation? Well, first we went to the police. They were not much help because, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) what can you do? Apparently, it's a real problem there. As soon as the guy took the bag, this taxi that was there suddenly started speeding up as if he was trying to run down the guy, which <laughs> I appreciated, but it, he didn't get him. Uh, and so we were telling the police this, and the police officer was like, oh, I wish he had got him. Like, apparently, it's a big, big enough problem that even <laughs> the police officers would be kind of grateful to the taxi guy for running down the thief, which I thought was actually kind of funny. That is funny. <laughs> yeah, but so that was really bad. And the problem, the big problem, well, there are two problems. Big problem number one was that it was a Thai holiday, and so the embassy was going to be closed for the long weekend. Big problem number two is that my reentry visa was expiring, and I had to get back to Thailand, or my visa would be voided. And so I had to eventually leave, which left my fiancé alone in Kuala Lumpur. Luckily, my friend James was here, and so he could help a little bit. He was able to stay a little bit longer. Uh, yeah, we, she had to go to the, the Thai embassy, get an emergency passport, then had to go to Malaysian immigration in Putrajaya and, and get an emergency like visa <laughs> transfer or something. And it was a real headache, and I wasn't able to be here to help. And it was, it was very scary at the time. Learned a lot of lessons in that trip. Learned not <laughs> to carry your passport when you're out and about. And the thing is, we made it a good trip. We did see a lot of cool stuff. We tried to make the best of it. Even after that had happened, we went to... Um, a, a really cool cave, temple, a Hindu temple in a cave, and we saw all the sites in Malaysia. But I didn't have a good impression of Malaysia <laughs> after that first trip. 
Now, I've returned since I've been to Kuala Lumpur again. I went in 2019, and I really enjoyed it. And now I think much more fondly of it. But at the time, I had a terrible impression because it was really stressful. It was very, very stressful. And when your first experience is getting robbed, I mean, come on. Exactly. And so in in a case like that, it kind of gives you a bad impression. Um, Fortunately, I didn't allow the impression to really color my image of Malaysia, and I had a really great experience. I've been back a couple times to Malaysia, different parts of Malaysia since, and I've enjoyed it. But it was just not a great way to start the trip, and it really soured the whole thing. So be careful with your passport, kids. I I would also say have a photocopy of it and carry that with you, because you can always be like, my passport's at my hotel. That's what I started doing. And if you absolutely have to carry your passport, have something where you can put it in like a pocket with a button. Like, I always wore a shirt with a button pocket that I can just mm-hmm. put it in there. You're not going to lose it. And no one's going to... If someone can pickpocket your chest pocket, then they deserve whatever's in there. You know, people don't typically want your passport. They're looking for your money. But it's horrible for you because then you're stuck in a really bad situation. I think that's every traveler's nightmare mm-hmm. is having their passport stolen or lost. <laughs> because you have to deal with the police report. And then to go to the embassy. And then go to the immigration department. I found one at the airport once in New York. I found one. I went to the bathroom and it was sitting on the sink Mm. and had their ticket in there and their flight had left like four hours ago. Oh no. And I was like, and it was going to like Australia or something like that. And I was like, Oh buddy. So I'm like, but why would you not go check the bathroom? Well, when you're panicking, you don't (laughs) don't think these things through. And I'm sure that person was panicking. Let's see, what do I got next? So I have one that failed before it started. So when my fiance and I were living in Reno, we had these all these plans. Reno, for anyone that doesn't know, people always were like, oh, are you going to go to Las Vegas? Reno is three hours from San Francisco and eight hours from Las Vegas. We were going to drive to San Francisco. We were going to leave real early, make a day of it, and go up to Redwoods. And so we, we got up that morning and something made me check and like the entire area that like our airbnb was in everything else was just on fire (laughs) we were all packed we were ready to go we just ended up like having just like a staycation (laughs) because we were really really disappointed and it was just like obviously we shouldn't have tried to go to california during fire season that's just dumb but again like the weather you can't predict the weather you can't control it had like changed direction and was just like on fire and if it wasn't on fire it was just so full of smoke that it's not fun anymore i have another colorado trip like that when we went to rocky mountain national park we got there and we got the one clear morning because there was big forest fires right around it it's it's really disappointing when you know there are mountains and you can't see them you're like all this beautiful scenery and you just can't see it that trip, the Colorado trip, was my most failed one, I think, because we we drove 12 hours to Colorado. We went to the National Park the next day. It spent the morning afternoon there. It started getting smoky in the afternoon. Went and had dinner, and then we left the next day. <laughs> there was no reason. There was nothing else to do. Mine are all weather, now that I think of it. Looking back at it, Pak Chong, I mean, there was something we could have done. We could have figured something out. But we, that was our call not to. But if it's fire or snow or something like that, I mean, yeah, you all have mine are, no control. All mine are weather. Over That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't think about that. They're all weather. Hmm. Well, I mean, weather derails, I think, a lot of people's adventures. No matter how good your plan is, weather can throw you for a loop. And it changes so often. You mm-hmm. can't... It can. You can look at the forecast, and then it can do something completely different. As someone that was in Boy Scouts... We've all been on a camping trip where it rained the whole time. And there is nothing you can do except sit in your tent. If you want something boring, go camping and then have it rain the whole weekend. Yeah, because in Boy Scouts, you weren't allowed to have your phones either. So it's not like you could even... Yeah. And, and phones back then couldn't do anything. So even if you had your phone, what, you what gonna were you going to do? It didn't have games on it. <laughs> Text someone for 25 cents a message? <laughs> yeah. Log onto the internet and it costs you like $80 for some reason. <laughs> but no, I mean, that's the most boring thing I can think of, is being stuck in a tent yeah. and it's raining. Because there is no amount of planning or anything else that can make a raining camping trip fun. All right, what's what's your what's your last one? Because that's all of mine. 
Okay, my last one is uh, a time that I went on a trip with my brother, who was a guest on the podcast. And you might actually remember this story as well, James. I think I told I you this. Do. The last time I was home in the United States, my brother and I were planning a trip to Colorado. Wow, a lot of these happened in Colorado, know, looking wild. back at it. That's weird. We were planning a trip to Colorado, and we had this big trip. We had planned for a long time. Our plan was to fly from Dallas to Denver, do some sightseeing in Denver, then rent a car, and we were going to drive to Boulder. Then we were going to go through Wyoming and South Dakota. We were going to end up at Mount Rushmore and then drive back and then fly back home from Colorado. So we had a round-trip ticket to Colorado. Mistake number one, we decided to do it cheaply. Mistake number one, we booked our tickets on Frontier. Mm. And uh, we got we got to the airport plenty early. And there was a very long line to check in and to check our bags. There was only one person working at the ticket counter. And the, the line wasn't moving. This person was going as slow as it is possible for a person to go. I, In this case, I truly do not think that we were at fault. I truly, truly think we were cheated by the airline. Because we waited in this line so long that the check-in time ended. We were in line. We'd been in line for over an hour. They put the little closed sign and just walked away, leaving like 20 people in line, frustrated. And they said, oh, sorry, check-in time has passed. And we're like, well, we've all been here. We've all been here for an hour. We got to this airport hours in advance. Um, but you didn't it let anyone check in. You didn't help us. And that was that. And, our, and we missed our flight. And they were completely unhelpful. They wouldn't they wouldn't say anything. They wouldn't even talk to us about it. It was really weird. We tried calling their customer service. They, they wouldn't help us in any way. They said, oh, sorry, you need to be at the airport an hour in advance. And we said, we were. We were at the airport an hour and a half in advance. I, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I had documented it some way. <laughs> there was nothing I could do. Annoyed, we went back home. My brother was extremely angry. I think I was more okay with it. He was extremely angry. I mean, he was... He was even, like, talking to other people in line, and he, like, wanted to rent a car with these two random ladies and drive up together. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I I don't care for people that much. <laughs> like, he really likes meeting people, and I think he's very okay with doing something like that. But it's like, if I don't know someone, I don't want to sit in a car with them driving to Colorado. Yeah. Like, that doesn't sound fun to me. And so I, I, I nixed that idea. He was really mad. I mean, he was fuming. So we get back home. And we're like, okay, we're not going to fly Frontier anymore. We are going to fly American Airlines because we know that they're maybe not, they may not be the best, but they're not going to cheat us. They're a legit airline. They're not some stupid budget airline. And so we booked it for like the next day. Beautiful day. We're ready to go. We get to the airport. We, we check in. We get our tickets. We drop our bags. We go through security. And we're in the terminal. Everything is going according to plan <laughs> until we hear the little announcement that says... There's been a, you guessed it, a terrible storm in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Again, weather rears its ugly head and that our flight has not been delayed, but canceled. And so we go to the American Airlines counter and we're like, okay, come on. It's not going to rain forever. <laughs> you know, like, what can you do? Can you put us on another flight? She looked at her computer and she's like, okay, I can put you on a flight on thursday or whatever it is but the flight that she was going to put us on would have been departing after our return flight i'm like that doesn't make any sense at all eventually we had to write off the whole thing there was just no way we could do it it was all going to fail they couldn't rebook us i think there were too many people to rebook the universe did not want you in colorado no that was the thing i was saying now i was again my brother was much angrier than i was but i think that living in thailand has tempered me a little bit so I'm used to things being delayed. I'm used to buses being delayed. And I'm I'm more used to the Thai attitude of accepting things as they come mm -hmm. and accepting things as, as fate. And I was like, yeah, you know, maybe maybe it's meant to be. Maybe if we had gone to Colorado, I would have fallen off of a cliff in Rocky <laughs> Mountain National Park and then gotten eaten by a bear. I don't know. Like maybe this is, yeah, the universe's way of telling us this trip is not meant to be. However, fortunately, he had packed like a, like a lunch. He had packed a lunch. You know, some oranges, some nuts, like a sandwich, and some little Tupperware containers of the appropriate travel size of white wine. Hmm. And so and then we sat in the terminal, we had our little picnic lunch, and we were just drinking little Tupperware containers of wine, which made things a bit better. Yeah. You know, I mean. and we just watched the planes come in for about half an hour, and we just hung out and we talked and drank our wine that he had not snuck through because you can do it but still it's kind of a weird thing to do <laughs> <laughs> it was a little weird <laughs> um 
And we enjoyed it in the end. And we decided we were going to go sightseeing in the airport before we left. And okay, that sounds a bit strange. We're like, we're going to make a, a trip out of this. The only thing that really they have in the airport that's anything unique, they have that in Terminal D, that kind of like sound maze mm -hmm. thing. We went to see that. And then we went to some of the airport chapels just to kind of see what they're like. Saw some interesting stained glass. I, I had never been to an airport chapel before. But we were like, okay, well, we're, we're going to sightsee and, and see whatever attractions there are in the airport. And we did. That's, I mean, that's, I remember you telling me about that. Because I kept texting you and being like, how's, how's the trip? And you'd be <laughs> like, well, it didn't happen. And then. <laughs> again. <laughs> again. And so I remember that. And I remember thinking like, that is the most failed thing. I think, I think the moral behind all this is just roll with it. And try to have fun, even if it's gone badly. Yes. There is always going to be something good that can come out of it, even if your trip fails completely. Whether it's just adjusting our attitude or doing something silly like touring airport <laughs> chapels, you know? Just try to find a way to make it fun in the end and have a memorable experience. You know, Pak Chong, we did nothing, but I still think of it as our trip to Pak Chong. I know, Even though was, we weren't intending to go there. It was fun. I liked it. There's always a way to enjoy it. And I think that's there's there's a lot to take away from that. It's it is mostly attitude, honestly. If you have a good attitude going into it, you'll be okay, even if it fails. Yep. Even if your snorkeling guy just says come back later, even if the universe does not want you in Colorado, <laughs> the universe always wants me in Colorado. Where does I'm trying to think if the universe doesn't want me anywhere? Kauai National Park. <laughs> it does not want us there. We probably would have got eaten by a tiger. Well, I think. That's all I got for that. Um, well, if, if you, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a failed adventure that you'd like to talk about, send us a message. You can go to our website or and click on the Contact Us button or email us hello at attemptadventure.com. Maybe, just maybe, we'll read it out on the air. So if you have a failed adventure, like the ones that we talked about today, do let us know. Yeah, and if you have something crazier, please let us know. I want to hear the biggest fail. It is time for our favorite segment, Adventures in the News, and this week it's my turn. Mine is a cautionary tale. This is a bad adventure. This is something that you should not do. Ooh. And the headline is this, Thai motocross bikers go spelunking, damage, historic Krabi Cave. It is an adventure, but it is grossly irresponsible. Hmm. So these guys went to um, a cave in Krabi, province in the south, and they ended up damaging the first and second of the cave's three levels. There were about 10 dirt bike riders who were riding their bikes in the cave. And now that sounds, maybe it sounds fun, it sounds interesting, it sounds like a real adventure, but they have damaged some ancient wall paintings that were there. It was a historical site. Um, the park officials were shocked. Apparently it never occurred to them that someone would do such a thing. They just never, I mean, who would, who would ride a, a motorcycle in a cave? You know, and it sounds like, okay, maybe it sounded like to them a harmless adventure, but I guess my, my caution, my warning is uh, be smart about these things. You know, always check before you do something. Make sure you're doing something properly. Make sure you're doing something smartly and wisely. Uh, and don't be reckless. It's, it's just like the story of the, uh, the backpackers a couple years ago who were arrested because they pitched their tent on the ancient Chiang Mai city wall. And they said, oh, we didn't know we weren't allowed to camp here. And it's like, you didn't know you weren't allowed to camp on a 13th century historical monument? You know, just because you're in Thailand doesn't mean you don't have to follow the laws or, or respect things. These people were Thai. These were not foreigners, thank goodness, because there's enough anti-foreign sentiment about these kind of things, about tourists behaving badly. But this is the type of thing that a lot of tourists do. They go to another country and they think that they can do anything they want, and that's mm -hmm. not good. So I guess my warning here is don't have an adventure at the expense of local norms or local customs or just general respect. With this... Which is odd because usually Thai people are very respectful of things like that. Yeah. So it's it's I was af I read through the article, but like real quick because I was afraid that they were going to be foreigners. This is the type of thing that tourists will come here mm -hmm. and do. Did they catch the people? Do they um, know? I don't know. Let me see. It doesn't say. No, they didn't because it says investigators suspect the bikers may have come from Krabi as well as Phuket. Yeah, it never occurred to them that someone would bring dirt bikes into the cave. I will admit it sounds like it was probably fun. It probably sure they had was. Fun. It sounds like it was fun. But but that doesn't matter because you can't damage something 
you can't do that because it'll be fun and and the whole thing where well i'm sure their argument was well it didn't say not to you got to use common sense here don't yeah. dirt bike in a historical site like that's not a that's just common sense and again, these were local people, but this is a big, big problem with tourists. And so as a tourist, don't do anything that you wouldn't do at mm-hmm. home. There, there's all this. There's always news about people who will go and, and want to get their Instagram pictures, and they'll go to a temple, and they'll do yoga. And they think, oh, it's so spiritual. I'm at a temple. Um, and they'll do like a handstand, which is horrible because in that case, you're putting your feet in the air, which in Thailand is, is, is a huge insult. That would be like mooning the crucifix in a cathedral. Mm-hmm. That would be the equivalent of that. But I think you wouldn't do a handstand in a church. Why would you do a handstand in a temple? Like, yeah. Why would you think that's okay just because it's a different culture? Like, why would you do that? Like, if you wouldn't do something at home, don't do it here. And I think I think this is just a warning, a general travel adventure warning. Because I think people will see these kind of things no matter where they are. And they'll want to do something fun and, and adventurous. But it cannot come at the expense of common sense. Right. And And I think... Just using your common sense is important. Don't don't mm-hmm. climb on walls. Don't. Yeah, I I can't fathom that that one. Like, who would first of all, who would climb on the ancient wall? Who would think that was okay? And second of all, why would you think it's okay to just randomly pitch your tent anywhere? That's not a camping site in any country. You know. I know. Like, <laughs> like what bugs me most about people that do that is they'll just like set up a tent somewhere, like they can camp anywhere. I'm like, you can't just set up a tent on mm-hmm. the side of the road. That's not how life works. No, it's not like you're in the wilderness. I mean, if you're in, in like a dispersed camping fine. area, Go that's ahead. fine. But if you're in the city, especially on an ancient ruin, stupid people. So, like I said, this is not so much about the adventure itself. This is more just a warning to please use common sense when you're having an adventure. Yes, please do. And don't be like these guys. Because now it's very possible that this cave is going to be closed off. And people won't get to go in anymore. And that tourists won't even be able to... To visit it and see these these historical cave paintings, and they're going to try to protect. That's them happened now. a lot with um like those cave dwellings in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Most of them you can't go up to anymore because people have done stupid crap, and and it's a real shame. So I don't know. I, I would just urge to use common sense, and I think that if you want to, if you want to actually hear more about this type of thing, I listened to a really good podcast episode just yesterday from Talk Travel Asia. They were interviewing one of the hosts of the Bangkok podcast about cultural faux pas of travelers in Southeast Asia and like some of the things that tourists will do and what not to do. And I think it's a really good episode. I will link that in the show notes as well, because I think that kind of goes over at least in this part of the world, some of the things that you shouldn't do and and stuff like this is on the list. You know, don't walk around the mall barefooted and shirtless, which a lot of tourists do. And it's seen as uh, very crass and you might even get fined. Well, and it's, it's because I think tourists, think of Thailand as this like even Bangkok which is a very modern very for lack of a better word western city mm-hmm. would you wouldn't go to New York and walk around a store without a shirt and shoes on why no. would you do it there because it's Thailand and because it's supposed to be this like they see they think of the entirety of the country as this like as Phuket as a beach town but it's not and Thai culture is a lot more modest mm-hmm. i mean if you go to the beach men typically don't swim without their shirts on. That could be for sun protection or whatever, but you rarely see shirtless men in Thailand. Uh, most people will wear those swimming shirts. I mean, so walking around the mall like that. Yeah, it's just dumb. Dumb. Yeah, check that episode out. That was a good one. I like that one. All righty. All right, James, why don't you take us home? All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. We, we enjoy doing this. We appreciate all of you. Just a little reminder of our monthly challenge. Go outside and make a cup of coffee, cup of tea, cup of whatever. Just make it. You want to make a milkshake outside? Go for it. You can find us at Attempt Adventure, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, www.attemptadventure.com. You can, you can go to our website, click the little Contact Us button right there, fill the little form out, send us whatever you want to say. We'll probably respond. If we really like it, We'll we'll, we'll talk about it. In the next episode, you can also reach us at hello at attemptadventure.com. Send us an email. That's right. And you can also send your monthly challenges to us via email. Yes. If you don't have Instagram and you don't want to use the hashtag, just send us an email, hello at attemptadventure.com with monthly challenge in the subject. Yes, and that does remind me, with the monthly challenge, when you do it, post your picture with hashtag attemptadventure, and the, the top three will be getting a little prize. 
Um, and the deadline is the last day of April, so we'll be reading the results sometime in May. Yeah. We'll be announcing who won sometime in May. Um, but you have all of April, 30 days of April, yeah. to do this challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. We really do appreciate it, and we enjoy doing this for you. Alrighty. Until next time, keep adventuring. Keep adventuring.